Shalom and welcome to another Pod for Israel. We're continuing our series on the case for Messiah. And today we're actually going to be looking at the Son of Man or one like a Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And so Golan, uh, the question we're actually going to be dealing with, did, did the New Testament get the Son of Man interpretation wrong? Some people have actually questioned uh, the New Testament's interpretation of Daniel 7, 13, and 14. So let's start with, by reading the text. We'll see what are we talking about? What's the, what's the text? Okay, so I'm, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Okay. I keep looking, or I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And again, that's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So, so, so this son of man, who does this <laughs> son of man refer to? That's the question. Boy, it, it really does depend who you ask, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's ask the New Testament. What okay. does the New Testament say? So the New Testament, without reservation, identifies Jesus as the one like a son of man in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And so just a couple of passages, Matthew 26 64 and 65, Jesus said to him, that is to the high priest, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. Mm -hmm. And again, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 Behold, he is coming with the clouds. The reference to the clouds, it's clear enough that yes, this, is, this is a messianic interpretation of Daniel 7, 13, and 14, where Jesus is recognized as the one like a son of man who will one day come again. So according to, uh, to the New Testament, to the authors of the New Testament, Yeshua accomplished this, uh, this uh, prophecy from Daniel. In other words, this passage is about Jesus. We, there is an aspect in the New Testament where they understand it, there's a future fulfillment, right? Yep. But they identify Jesus without reservation as the one like a son of man. Okay, so what are the objections that we're getting? What are the, 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 the best objections we're getting? Yeah, so according to the opposing interpretations of this passage... Okay. Uh, there, there are actually a couple. So number one, there are those who actually argue that Jesus cannot be one like the Son of Man here because according to the text, one like a Son of Man in Daniel 7 is Israel. The nation Israel. It's the whole nation Israel. It is not the Messiah. Okay, that's okay. first. That's first. But now there's another objection that would actually argue that, well, of course, Daniel 7, 13 and 14 is about the Messiah, but it can't be Jesus because Daniel 7, 13 and 14 is only referring to a completely human Messiah. There's nothing divine about this Messiah. Yep. And the third one? And the third objection would be that, of course, this cannot be Jesus because when the Son of Man comes... The, the, the kingdoms of the world will be, uh, it will be destroyed and the Son of Man will set up an eternal kingdom. Because Jesus didn't set up an eternal kingdom, this can't refer to Jesus. Okay, so these are the three claims. So let's go one by one and start with the first claim, which says again that Jesus cannot be the Son of Man here in Daniel 7 because the Son of Man is Israel. Now, let me make it clear. It's really important as we work through these texts. Number one, we want to keep a respectful dialogue. You know, sometimes in the comments, we've seen some things that are kind of angry against those who disagree with us or angry against the Jewish people, but we're speaking as Jewish people who love Jewish people. And so we're just dealing with ideas and, yep. and, and it's really important. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So, and yeah. so what we're going to do as we deal with these claims we want to look at the text. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to present the arguments fairly. Exactly. Right? I don't want to... I had a friend of mine that once said, you know, in, de, in a debate, it's wrong to straw man, that you kind of characterize somebody else's views and then slam it down. You don't go after the straw man, you go after their iron man. So, so, so we want to be, be correct with answering the actual objection. Correct. It's really important. So 
here is, and I think that there's actually good textual evidence that the Son of Man is Israel. Okay, mm -hmm. let's be clear. So at least they're using the text. The, and I appreciate this argument. This is, a, this is an interesting argument. So, so, so what's the best defense for okay. the Son of Man being Israel? Yes. So I want you to notice in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, you've got the one like a Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and all nations and people serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, mm -hmm. etc. Okay. Daniel uh, is apocalyptic literature, and as is often the case, there are interpretations of the text within the text. And so, Daniel actually gets a heavenly messenger to interpret the text. And so, mm -hmm. notice the interpretation, verses 15 through 18. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. Here it goes. And this is important. This is very important. The great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. <clears throat> but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Notice in the interpretation, it's as if the Son of Man is completely ignored. In other words, or you could say it differently, that after the beasts are destroyed, the kingdom is given directly to, to the saints, to the saints of, the of the Most High, or the Highest One. And therefore, the saints of the Most Highest One are obviously the one like the Son of Man. And so this proves that because there's no reference to the Messiah here, but to the people of Israel, that the one like of son of the Son of Man is not Israel. It's the people of it, so the it's not the Messiah, it's Israel. Yes, yeah, so the objection refers to the saints of the highest as Israel. Correct. Yep. Exactly. So the giving of the kingdom to those the saints of the highest one is the interpretation of the giving of the kingdom to the one like the Son of Man. Yep. And let me just kind of we'll We'll look at it a little bit more. Again, I want you to notice this one like the Son of Man in verses 13 and 14, who receives dominion and glory yep. and a kingdom, okay? Notice the interpretation, okay? Verses 26 through 27, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away. That is the little horn, annihilated and destroyed forever. Mm -hmm. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms un under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Again, the people of the saints. Exactly. So here the argument is that the saints are the one like the son of man. It's not the Messiah, it's Israel. And let's be fair. This is a, I, I appreciate this objection because it's a close reading of the text. Of the text, yep. It uses the text. But I would argue that it's not a close enough reading <laughs> so of the what's, text. So what's our response? What okay. would be the proper response? So there are three, actually four, but let's look at, let's look at uh, the first one. Yep. Response number one, actually, if we look a little bit more closely at the angelic interpretation, the one like a son of man here must be a king. It has to be a king. It has to be a king. Look at verse 17 again. Okay, yeah. let's look at verse 17. We'll look at the larger passage, but notice verses 15 through 18. I'm going to read mm -hmm. it again, yeah. okay? As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me. I'm going to skip it. I approached one like of those who were standing by, mm -hmm. and he began asking him the exact meaning of it all. So he told me, and he made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are... Four kings. It doesn't say four kingdoms. Right. It actually says, the interpretation says for kings. kings. So the assumption is that if we're dealing with four kings, the beast represents the kings of the nations, then one like the son of man has to be the king, the king. of Israel. Exactly. Okay, that's the interpretation. Now, response two. Okay, response two. According to the angelic interpretation, the saints receive the kingdom not from the ancient of days, but from the one like the son of man. Okay. Now you're going to have to, and we have to work through this slowly because we're dealing with an Aramaic text. And, but it's, we have to, and it's an important distinction. <laughs> an important distinction. <laughs> exactly. That's what I meant to say. Let's look at verse 18. Okay. I want you to notice verse 18. 
And, and by the way, this argument, I recently, I found, an, and it was a really great argument, James Hamilton makes this case in a mm. recent publication. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom, okay? So the Israel interpretation assumes that the highest one here who gives, uh, who gives the kingdom to the saints is the ancient of days. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so the Israel interpretation, I would argue... <laughs> is based on a faulty assumption. Yep, and, and we want to show exactly why if you, if you look clearly yes. on the, and closer Correct. on the text. So let's look a little bit closer at the text. Daniel 2 through 7, very important to, 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 to remind our listeners that Daniel 2 through 7 is actually not written in Hebrew. It's written in Aramaic, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> and we'll talk more about this as we continue, but what's Really important to notice is that there are actually two similar but not identical words for God's exalted status or divine exalted yeah, status. From the same root, but it, it's Correct. not the same word. So there's one word, Ilaya, the Most High, mm -hmm. the Most High. The Aleph here representing the, the Most High, yep. and then there's another word that that the New American Standard translate as the highest one, Ilionin. Now, it's a plural of majesty, just like Elohim, Elohim, right? But it means the highest one. They're two different words. Now, the word most high, the most high, Ilya, is used 10 times in the book of Daniel, in the Aramaic section, nine times in Daniel 3 through 6, and once, only once, in, in Daniel, Daniel 7. 7. The other word, Elionin, the highest one, is only used four times in the book of Daniel. And you know what? Only Where? chapter seven. Only in chapter seven and only after the vision of the one like the son of man. Trying to prove something. Okay. So if we're going to, if, if exegesis is a careful interpretation of the text, we have to ask why is Elionin, the most high, a brand new word that's introduced and only in Daniel seven. And so, here's what we would argue, and I think it's very sound argument, that since the highest one is only used in Daniel 7, and only after the vision in Daniel 7, 13, and mm -hmm. 14, the highest one must refer to the Messianic king who receives everlasting dominion from the ancient of days. In other exactly. words... Why, did, why is this new word introduced? Because the moment that one like the Son of Man comes in the clouds and he receives all dominion and power glory. and glory, suddenly we have two exalted figures. And you have to differentiate between them with Ex two different words. Exactly. And so here's the interpretation. Daniel 7, 18 actually affirms the messianic interpretation by telling us that the saints will receive the kingdom from the highest one. Who is the highest one? The one like the son of man. And this happens after the beasts are defeated. Exactly, exactly. And response number three. Okay. So this is also really important, Golan. To say that one like the son of man, uh, one like a son of man is Israel, it actually completely contradicts the theology of the book of because Daniel. Because it assumes that men, Israel, can get worship. Yes, and that's and yes, and we're gonna we're gonna spend uh, more time on this as we continue this podcast. But I want you to notice that according to the vision of the one like the Son of Man, when he comes, it says that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. And that's an important word in the original text, in the original Aramaic. Okay, yeah, and we'll talk about we'll it. We'll talk about it. So the question becomes in the structure of the book of Daniel. Who do we serve? Who do we serve? The word here? Serve for worship, you mean, yeah? Okay. So notice the word that's used here. When the nations are serving the Son of Man, or the one like a Son of Man, the, the Aramaic word is palach. Plach. Yep. Plach, plach. Okay. But it's pei lamed chet, the root word. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in Hebrew today, we have the word pulchan, right? Exactly, worship. What? Pulchan means worship, right? But here's what's interesting. The word plach in in, the, in Targum Ankulas and other Targumim means... Just work. To work. 
But in the book of Daniel and actually in the Hebrew Bible, whenever there's an Aramaic text, that word is exclusively used for worship. For worship, some kind of the deity, either false or true. Correct. Okay. In the book of Daniel, the word is only used. So, for instance, in Daniel 3, uh, 14, mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, the three, the three Hebrews, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not plach, you do not serve, serve worship. my gods or worship the golden image I've set up? Yep. Notice verse 28 mm -hmm. in chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielding up their body so as not to plach, plach, serve or worship any God except their own. In the book of Daniel, this word, plach, is reserved for the worship of divine beings. And in the context of proper worship, when I say divine beings, false ones too. It could be false idols. Yeah. It can be idols, but it's forbidden. And so the fact that we would say that all the nations would worship right? that Israel, the, it that just doesn't, it doesn't, sound doesn't right. make sense so, at so all. The argument, goes, the, the argument goes like this. So let, let's see the argument. So, if, yeah? so from lesser to greater. Exactly. So if the Hebrews refuse to serve a false god in Daniel worship, 3. Worship, yeah, and remember we're talking about worship. Worship, yep. right? If the Hebrews refuse to serve, plach, mm -hmm. a false god in Daniel 3, and Daniel refuses to pray to the king to plach, right, to serve a false god in Daniel chapter 6, why is it okay for all the tribes, tongues, and nations to worship, to worship Israel? Israel? Yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't make sense. Theologically, the it doesn't make sense, yep. And so we would argue what that one like a son of man cannot be Israel. Who who do you think it is then, according to the text? It has to be uh, the Messiah. It has to be the Messiah. It can't be. It cannot be Israel. And Golan, you are our expert in rabbinic literature so, here. So is there I, any support? So I would ask you to read the quote, and we have a support from the Talmud. It, the sages themselves thought, saw this passage as a messianic prophecy. In other words, to claim that the New Testament twisted or got this passage wrong is is kind of misleading because then what about all the other Jewish interpreters that, exactly. that also say the other, same thing as the New Testament? Yep. In other words, the, the, the Jewish authors of the New Testament were not the only one. Exactly. So we're going to read from Sanhedrin 98a, uh, yep. okay? Rabbi Alexandri says, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming of the Messiah. It is written, There came with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man, and there was given to him, or given him, dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And it is, it is written, Behold, your king will come to you. He is just and victorious, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey." Rabbi Alexandri says Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming of the Messiah, yeah. right? And, and he uses he uses that Daniel that, seven thirteen through fourteen exactly. and Zechariah nine nine. And the question is, you know, does the Messiah come in the clouds of the air, or does he come? It, on a donkey, yeah. or does he come on a flying donkey? Right. So, so the rabbi, so, so the rabbi say, if Israel are righteous, he would come in heaven, in, in the clouds of heaven. If right. Israel are sinful, yeah. But, but the point is, they're looking at it as a messianic prophecy. Okay, there's no arguments here. Yeah. So okay. let's go to claim number two. What was what was the second claim against the, the the New Testament interpretation? Okay, so there are those that actually would argue. Okay, of course Daniel seven thirteen and fourteen, one like a son of man, absolutely it's the Messiah. Like the Talmud says. Like the Talmud says, but here it cannot be Jesus, absolutely can't be Jesus, because, because son of man only means a human being. Yes, son of man, right? This has nothing to do with divinity, it has nothing to do with divine status, and therefore Jesus, this cannot refer to Jesus, at least according to the New Testament's depiction of Jesus. Yep. So, so, the, so the claim uses, of course, verses and verses, for example, to prove their point. Okay. So if you look at, for instance, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1, mm -hmm. okay, uh, God calls Ezekiel son of man. And in fact, 
the word son of man or the phrase son of man is used over 90 times mm. in Ezekiel. And of course, Ezekiel is only a man. We're not tempted to fall down and worship Ezekiel. <laughs> so son of man is absolutely, according to, as the argument goes, it just means a human being. And another argument for, for the humanity of this son of man. Okay, so here the argument goes that, listen, the fact that the nation's tribes are serving the Messiah in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, verse 14, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that he's, a, he's divine. Yeah. He's just a human king. And here's because? the proof. Well, Jeremiah 27, six through seven. Now I've given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his sons and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. It doesn't mean that that Nebuchadnezzar, because they're worship, because they're serving Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't make Nebuchadnezzar God. Exactly. And so here's the refutation, right? That this cannot be Son of Man, just a human being serving, does not mean that he's God whatsoever. Yeah, he doesn't have to be divine. So what is our response to this claim? Well, claim. what do we say all the time? Context, context, context. Exactly. Okay. So here we need to make we need to make clear again that we're discussing ideas. We're not attacking people. We're discussing ideas and obviously we're we're arguing and wrestling over the meaning of text. And so we'll always go back to context as the most important and determining factor to the meaning, even to the layout of, of, of the book of Daniel itself, right? And you, and you know what? Daniel is a beautiful book. I mean, obviously, all, every book of the Bible is beautiful. But I want you to notice something. If you look at the structure of the Aramaic of Daniel, so chapter 2 through 7, you have this Aramaic structure mm -hmm. where the ends are paralleled as we move into the center. In other yeah. words, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, you have... Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the four part statue, mm -hmm. Daniel's vision of the four beasts. You have the coming of the stone not cut with hands who destroys the kingdoms, the sunning of the coming of the one like the son of man who destroys the four beasts. Beautiful. Okay. You have the establishment of God's eternal kingdom in chapter two. After the beasts are destroyed, you have the establishment of God's eternal kingdom after the beasts are destroyed. So two and seven are parallel. Two and seven are parallel. Yes. Three and six are parallel. In chapter three, you have the Jewish men that refuse to worship the false gods, mm -hmm. right? In chapter six, you have Daniel who refuses to pray to the king, a false deity. In chapter three, the three men are thrown into a fiery furnace because their refusal to worship non-gods. And in six, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den because of his refusal to worship a non-god. In both chapters, God sends his angel to rescue them. And then the king, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Darius gives glory to the God of Israel. Amen. Now, chapter four and chapter five, as we move in, are also parallel. Yeah. In both chapters, you have a proud king of Babylon. In both chapters, Daniel is called to interpret dreams mm -hmm. or writing on a wall. Mm -hmm. In both passages, God humbles the king of Babylon, in one case temporarily, in another case permanently. Yep. So why is this important? Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 are crucial for us determining the meaning of the word plach, serve. And that's, that's the word we, 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 we mentioned earlier and said we're going to go back to it because it's a crucial word. We have to spend some time here because here we see, uh, whom, the question is, whom shall we serve in the book of Daniel? Who do we serve? Who are we willing to serve and who are we willing to die so as not to serve? And again, the word serve in the meaning of worship. Worship yes. is plach. either a false deity or a true deity. We're not denying the fact that the word plach, an Aramaic word, is used by later Jewish Aramaic texts just to, to mean, mean work. work. But that's not the question. What does it mean in Daniel? In Daniel. Exactly. And so I want you to notice there are two, there's false worship and true worship. Yep. So I'm going to go through these passages because we need to see it. In Daniel 3, 12, these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not worship, plach, your gods or worship, right? <laughs> they don't serve your yep. gods or worship the golden image you've set up. Daniel 3, verse 17, 
if it be so, our God whom we Worship. serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. Okay. Daniel 3, verse 14, false worship. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not plach, you do not serve my gods or worship the golden Im image I've set up? On the other side, Daniel 6, verse 16, your God, he says, uh, Darius says to Daniel, your God whom you constantly mm -hmm. serve will deliver you. Daniel 3, verse 18, but even, here's the, the, the Hebrew saying, even if God does not deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to plach. We're not going to serve your gods exactly. or worship the golden image that you've set up. And now the important part, yes. Well, okay. The most important verse, part. Chapter six, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able, been able to deliver you? Now watch. Exactly. 328. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their body so as not to what? Plach, to serve or worship any God except their own God. Yep. Who do you plach? Who do you worship in the book of Daniel? Okay? And here we have 714. 714. And to him, the one like a son of man is given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might Blah, sir, worship, worship him. In other words, he has to be divine. He, to say that he's only a human being here is actually to 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 point to a contradiction in the theology of the book of Daniel. But of course we would argue that that there's no contradictions of here. The one like a son of man here is divine. So let me ask you this, does this word in Aramaic appears anywhere else in the Aramaic Bible, in the Aramaic portion of the Hebrew Bible? You know what? It only appears one other time, hmm. only one other time in Ezra chapter 7, verse 34. And let's see the context, okay. Again, it, it, we also, here, I'll read it. We also inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any priests, Levites, singers, doorkeepers, netinim, or servants, of the house of God. The word here for servants of the house of God, it, it, it's in the context of religious worship. And so whenever plach is used in, in, in the Hebrew Bible. In the Aramaic part, of course, in yes. In the Aramaic sections of the Hebrew Bible, it's a word that is exclusively used for the worship or for false worship of divine beings. It, it's connected to, to, to worship of divine beings so exactly the one like a son of man has to be divine he has to be okay so let's fully go. god not partially god exactly fully god S so let's go back to ezekiel because because what about ezekiel wasn't ezekiel the <laughs> son of man well here's what's really amazing i want you to notice yes ezekiel is is called son of man but i want you to notice there's a passage that sheds a lot of light mm. on one like a son of man in daniel 7 let's read it you ready for this? Yep. So where are you reading are, from? Uh, do you have your seatbelt on? Because you're going <laughs> to fall off your chair. I'm reading from Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. Now above the expanse that was over the heads, their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Wow. The appear so who is this one seated on a throne with an appearance, with the appearance of a man? Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire and there was radiance around him as the appearance, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds. Notice the mm -hmm. reference to clouds yep. on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. Wow. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice speaking. So Ezekiel himself, seeing in the vision, somebody appearance of a man, and he identifies it with the glory of the Lord, the glory of God. So to say that one like a son of man is completely human, number one, it disregards the meaning of 
serve or worship in Daniel. But number two, it just, it throws out or it disregards the fact that Ezekiel sees a similar vision mm. of someone who has an appearance like of a man, man, but it's the full glory of God. It's he, God himself. And he falls on his he face. He falls on his face, just like the nations who worship. Okay, so let's go to the final claim, the final objection. Well, before we go to the final objection, no. because remember, you are our, you are our rabbinic... <laughs> so Scott. even from the Talmud, we have we, we we have we have a verse or a quote that reinforces the the, the divine. We, at least we have a dispute between two rabbis. Okay, and I want you to read the dispute yeah. between Rabbi Akiva and his fellow rabbis. So this is from Hagiga. Yep, fourteen uh, a. The Gemara poses poses another question. One verse states his throne was fiery flames. Daniel seven nine, and another phrase in the same verse states till thrones were placed and one who was ancient of days sat, implying the existence of two thrones. So they're referring to that text in, the, in, in, in Daniel 7. Absolutely. The Gemara answers, this is not difficult. One throne is for him and one is for David, as it is taught in the Baraita with regard to this issue. One throne for him, God, and one for David, i.e. the Messiah. This is the statement of Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva saw a divine Messiah sits next to God. And what's the and what's the what did Rabbi Akiva suffer? What was the objection to okay, him? Okay, so Rabbi Yossi Haglili said to him, Akiva, how long shall you make the divine presence profane? That's blasphemy, right? By presenting it as though one could sit next to him. Rather, the two thrones are designated for two different purposes, and he goes on to explain. So Rabbi Yossi understood that Akiva is claiming a divine Messiah. Or at least a Messiah that has, <laughs> that's sitting in the divine throne room. Yep. Right? We're not just talking about just an ordinary human being. So we have a quote from the Talmud that also says that at least there was a dispute among Jewish men about the identity of this Messiah. Correct. Yep. So what's the, the, the final claim? Okay. So the final claim against um, the New Testament's interpretation of Daniel 7, 13, and 14, Jesus absolutely can't be the son of man because he didn't establish the eternal kingdom. If he's the son of man, why were not the beastly kingdoms and the beasts, these kings of the earth, destroyed? Yep. Okay. So here's the objection. When the Son of Man comes, all the nations serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And the argument goes that Jesus is not ruling and reigning yep. on the earth. And by the way, didn't the disciples of Yeshua himself anticipated that he would he would bring the kingdom to Israel? Do you remember, what is it in Acts chapter one, yeah. right? They said, is it at this time you will establish your kingdom and in Israel? And what did he tell them? He says, it, you, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, exactly. okay? But the argument is, is since Jesus didn't establish, you know, since the kingdom wasn't established in Jesus' day, Jesus can't be the one like a son so of man. So what's our response for that? Well, the response is, is actually quite a simple response. It's just, we need to have a, a, a fair reading of the New Testament, right? Yep. And, and a fair reading of the New Testament, the New Testament never claims that Jesus actually, when he came, set up the kingdom, in other words, Daniel 7, 13 through 14 will be fulfilled when Yeshua returns. Amen. Again, that's what the Amen. text says. Look at Matthew 26, 64 through 65. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He says, you will see it. Look at Revelation 1, 7 again. Behold, he, that is... The one like a son of man is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Zechariah will have a podcast about yep. that as well. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. And so we are not claiming- We're looking for the fulfillment when Yeshua returns. In this, we, we, we join with our, our Jewish- brothers in the flesh, right? We are longing for that day when, when the Messiah returns or comes and establishes an eternal kingdom. The difference is, is that we know from the scriptures that Jesus is that returning or coming Yeah, and by Messiah. the way, remember that dispute in the, in, in the Talmud that they say that, that there's alleged contradiction coming with a, in, in, on a donkey or with the clouds. And we're saying he came riding on a donkey and he will come 
with the clouds. That's a very good point. Yeah. Excellent point. In other words, there is no dispute. He's not going to come on a flying donkey. <laughs> He's going to come twice. And the New Testament actually argues the first time Messiah came on a donkey. So, okay, so let's sum up the, the, the arguments, but one by one. Okay, so here are the arguments. First, although some argue that the one like a son of man is Israel, the angelic interpretation and the worship that he receives makes it clear that we're talking about the Messiah. It has to be the Messiah. A person, yeah. Right, a person, not a nation. Secondly, for those who argue that we're just dealing with a human Messiah, not a divine Messiah, we're arguing this cannot be. Why? Because the worship he receives in the context of Daniel, of Daniel. would be entirely inappropriate <clears throat> if the Messiah is not fully divine. Exactly. Okay. Third and finally, for those that argue that Jesus cannot be the son of man because he didn't establish uh, God's eternal kingdom, we would argue and agree that, th that Jesus will one day come again. In other words, the New Testament affirms that one day Jesus will set up an eternal kingdom here on earth. Amen, because he did what he had to do the first time he came. Why and did he come the first time? <laughs> to die for our sins. Amen. And he resurrected. God resurrected him from the dead. So we have the hope. If he did what he had to do the first time, when he comes back, he'll, he'll, he'll do the rest. Amen. And so Amen. in this series, again, our goal is not to create antagonism with people and towards people that disagree with us. Our desire is to encourage people to go back to the texts and to study carefully for themselves. And we're hoping that if you'll look carefully at these texts, you will see that it is quite reasonable to believe that the New Testament correctly identified Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward to reach others who need to hear this message? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.